All right. And we are ready for part two, which has to do with another German. Oh. Not this one. She is part German shepherd, but she knows nothing about sociology. All done. No, this German is a fellow named Ferdinand Tunnies. He lived in the late 1800s, so a generation after Karl Marx. By this point, the Industrial Revolution is well underway. And the question for Tunnies is less what's happening than how is it affecting society? What's changing in the social world? Because now we're almost 100 years into this process. And it's obvious this is not temporary. And whatever's happening in the world is happening forever. Society is changing in fundamental ways. And Tunnies is trying to figure out what are those ways and what does it mean for us? Okay, this is, this is a good place to make sure you've got your, those lecture outlines in front of you because we've got a complicated list of ideas he's going to be looking at. And it will be helpful to have those in front of you. This is the ideas of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft that showed up back in chapter four. were kind of confusing and I didn't say anything about because they really come in here. Tanis is looking at the society and these are German words because he's German and they're big complicated words because, well, he's German. Gemeinschaft can be roughly translated into English as community. And Gesellschaft could be roughly translated as association. You can think of Gemeinschaft as the old world, the pre-industrial world, the village full of peasants, those subsistence peasants, self-contained that we started with back on Monday. That's the pre-industrial world he's looking at. And he looks at this world of these small communities as well, four characteristics. So the first of these is indeed the idea of community. There's, a, there's a, a sense of community that people have, of being connected to each other, of being in this all together. That village where people know each other for their entire lifetimes and going back generations. So people live in a community. That's the first thing. Secondly, kind of connected to that, is all of our relationships within that community. All the people we're connected to, those relationships are, are personal. Uh, they're intimate, they're multifaceted. As I say, we know people as, as people. I know, that doesn't make much sense, but we know them in all sorts of facets. So the, my neighbor, who's another peasant farmer, and we work together, particularly this is harvest time. We got to get in the harvest. We got to do it quick before the weather turns against us. We work together. But then we, we go into the village to, to drink together. On Sundays, we're in church together. Our kids play together. We dance together at the festivals. We defend the village together when that's called for. We, we know each other in all these different aspects neighbor, friend, distant cousin, church members, and, and on and on. So our relationships are multifaceted. They bring in lots of statuses, lots of roles. We know people's entire status set. We're not done with all those ideas from part one. So that's the second thing. That's part of being in community is that we know each other so well. Okay, because of that, how do we keep order? How do we enforce the norms so that people act accordingly and properly? Well, it's done informally. What uh, Tanis calls moral suasion. That's the, the third one on the list in the notes. Moral suasion, think of the word persuasion. How do we get people to do what they're supposed to? Well, in this case, it's informal. We, uh, we, we know people, we apply informal pressures. They know what they're supposed to do. We all know the rules. They're the same for all of us. 
because we are pretty much all the same living in this village with all these connections. And what people think of us is important. Because if I get out of line, and I'm not following the rules, then what's going to happen? Other people, the rest of the village, are going to get mad at me. They're not going to speak to me. They may cut me off. So what? Well, so that means I've got no one to help me when I need help getting my crops in. I've got no one to talk to because there isn't anybody else. And I can't go on social media because that won't exist for thousands, hundreds of years. Uh, I can't socialize with people at church. I've got no one to drink with. I've got, you know, all of a sudden my whole life has just disappeared. That's uncomfortable. Even if they don't completely cut me off, the fact that people are mad at me, they're ticked off at me. Again, I can't escape that. That's my whole world. I'm suffering these negative sanctions throughout. And so I'm going to avoid that. So I don't need people telling me what to do. I don't need a policeman watching me. My neighbors are doing that. And I want to fit in. I want to have a comfortable life. So enforcing the norms, enforcing the rules, that's done just with these informal mechanisms. We want to get along with the members of our community. We have to get along with the members of our community or life's just unlivable. And all of that works because the fourth characteristic, people are all pretty much the same. These communities are very homogenous, which just means the same. There's not a lot of differences. We're all peasant farmers. We're all growing the same crops. We're all following the same schedule. We're all using the same skills. There's little change. There's not new people moving in. There's not people moving out. Our farming life has not changed. It doesn't change very quickly. There's no culture lag here. The material culture changes very slowly. So we're doing things the way we've always done them. And everybody is the same. Homogenous community. That's the old world. That's the pre-industrial peasant village, Gemeinschaft, community. But then industrialization comes along. It throws all this up in the air. It disrupts these communities. Our peasants are leaving their peasant villages and going into the big city where they're becoming workers in communities numbering in the tens of thousands or even millions. And so we get this new form, this Gazelleschaft association. And it is pretty much just the opposite. So again, if you're looking at your notes, like the next column is just the mirror image of the first things that I laid out. So, little sense of community. We, we don't know our neighbors. We have no connections to them. Think of living in a big apartment building. You don't know the people on either side. You don't know the people down the street. You have little connections to them. So there's little sense of community, of connection. Our relationships, that was this one, relationships are task-oriented, not personal. Or to put it in language from earlier in the semester, we just deal with people with one status, one of their roles, not the whole status set. Think of us. Even if we're in class together, even if we're not in class, we just encounter each other on campus. All of our relationships are pretty much stru structured around my role as teacher, your role as student. And all of our interactions are kind of connected in with that, and we know very little else about each other. So we don't relate, and it's not terribly important. The fact that you now know what my dog looks like and the fact that I've got way too many gourds growing in my garden right now isn't really relevant to our interactions in class. Those are all just going to be structured around this one dimension. 
And then, of course, we know lots of people. In fact, part of this is we know a lot more people in the gazelle shaft. But each one of those people is contained within a particular task. So, student teacher. Go over to Giant Eagle to get uh, stuff for the weekend. So that you've got plenty of snacks and stuff for, for homecoming and going to the game. And there's the, the cashier. And she checks you out. And maybe she even knows you because you go every Friday to pick up stuff. But even if she knows your name, she basically just knows you as a customer and you know her as a cashier. Now you can have perfectly friendly relationships within there and some nice conversations and she's interested in sort of what you're doing and everything, but it's all within that context. And you don't know anything else about her and she doesn't know anything else about you. And so on and on. So we may have a lot more people that we're connected to, but each one of those connections is along just one task or one role. Okay, so that's very different. And then because of that, how do we enforce the norms? How do we make sure people behave? Because you know what? In that apartment building where all you know about that old lady who lives across from you is that she's the old lady who lives across from you and has a dog, that's no connections. You don't really care what she thinks. You don't care if you annoy the neighbors or not. So maybe they, they give you a nasty look in the morning after you've had your music playing loud. Well, you only interact with them for 30 seconds while you're leaving the apartment building where you're heading to get your bus. Who cares? You don't have this web of different relations that you got to get along with these people throughout the day in all kinds of different roles and contexts. No, it's just the neighbor that you see in the elevator and that's it. She's just the lady who checks you out at Giant Eagle. I'm just your teacher. Opinions don't carry as much weight. That informal mechanisms, yeah, they don't carry much weight. So instead, we got to rely upon formal mechanisms of control. You know, police, courts. So how does that old lady get you to turn your music down if you don't care what she thinks and you don't care if she glares at you in the morning? Well, she calls the police and they show up and say, uh, you know, noise ordinance says you got to turn it down. So these formal mechanisms of police and courts and things suddenly become important in the modern world, in the gazelle shaft, because we've lost that community that did it informally in the old world. And connected to that is the idea of everyone's different. We live in heterogeneous communities. Lots of differences. Again, think big city. People come from all over. And they're doing all kinds of different things. And existing in different roles. And there's lots of change. That old lady, she's going to move out in a year or two. You're going to move. You're going to get another job. You're going to have another set of roles. And those are going to change over time. You're going to leave student behind. And you're going to become junior accountants and you're going to get bored with that and go to law school and be a lawyer and you're going to get married and have kids and coach soccer until you get bored with soccer and they grow up and you do something else change different communities different people so very heterogeneous very mixing and that also kind of undermines this sense of community that was at the heart of the Gemeinschaft we don't know those people really well because they're so different from us. In the Gemeinschaft, we knew pretty much what those people were like because they were like us and things didn't change much. So for Tunnies, the social world is changing irrevocably and fundamentally from this community where we're all connected to this abstract, this association, this gazelle shaft where it's all these strangers. You can tell from the language and the way I've been describing it that Tunney's doesn't necessarily think this is a good change. It's not that he's recommending it and saying we should change in this way. That's not what 
sort of theory is about. It's not what should happen, but what is happening. It's an explanation. And like it or not, industrialization is changing the very fabric, the very nature of the social world that we live in. In these important ways, and we need to understand what they are, because like it or not, we're losing this valuable sense of community, these connections, and we're going to this other thing with all of its cold association. It's right there in the, in the words. But like it or not, it's coming. Or actually, he says, like it or not, it's here. It's developing. So that's Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Ways in which the social world is changing. But... Is it necessarily a bad thing? I mean, Tani's thinks it is. There's Tani's judgment. We're losing something important. We're losing community and replacing it with this other thing. But of course, what he's done is both analyze the change and then he's put a value judgment on it. Could we look at it another way? Well, somebody did. That's our last video. So, how else can we look at this?